everyone, and welcome to the Zucre Recovery Life Podcast. My name is John A., and I am an alcoholic in West Palm Beach, Florida. My sobriety date is September 13th of 1982. We're going to start off with a quote by Albert Einstein, as we usually do. If you cannot explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. We call ourselves the Zoo Crew because although we are deadly serious about sobriety, we want to show others, mainly newcomers, that sobriety is not boring at all. You can visit our website at thezookrew.org, thezookrew.org. Feel free to like this video, subscribe to our channel, and hit the notification button so you can be notified when we upload new videos. Leave a comment and we will respond. If you like our message of recovery, please share our podcast site with others. In this episode of the Zoo Crew Recovery Life podcast, the topic is relapse prevention. Oftentimes, the ties that bind us are more mental than physical. Here's an example. In India, one method of training elephants was to tie a baby elephant to a tree with a thick, heavy chain, thereby severely restricting its movement and almost immobilizing it. After a long time of this treatment, all an elephant handler had to do is tie a rope around the elephant and put a stake in the ground to keep the elephant in place. The elephant was so conditioned to thinking that it was unable to move that some of them have been found dead in place after a fire. This elephant is bigger than a house and all it had to do was try to move and it would have escaped the fire but it thought it was still chained to a tree. The purpose of this podcast is not to make anyone feel bad if they have relapsed, nor is it meant to pat you on the back if you have not yet relapsed. And notice I said not yet. Relapse is not a joke. Alcoholism is not a joke. This is a life and death matter. We tell people to keep coming back but not everyone makes it back after a relapse. The best way to avoid relapsing is to take the steps, have the psychic change, work with others, and never, never rest on your laurels. And this is from the big book, page 85. It's very easy to let up on the spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels. We are headed for trouble if we do for alcoholism is a subtle foe. We are not cured of alcoholism. What we really have is a daily daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. Every day is a day when we must carry the vision of God's will into all our activities. How can I best serve thee? Thy will, not mine, be done. These are thoughts which must go with us constantly. We can exercise our willpower along this line all we wish. It is the proper use of the will. If you have relapsed, thank your higher power that you made it back into the rooms of AA because as I've said, not everyone makes it back. The door does not always swing both ways. And if you have not yet relapsed, you don't have to in the future. And again, if you have relapsed, you do not have to relapse again. And please uh, don't call yourself a chronic relapser. Self-talk is very, very important. And calling yourself a chronic relapser is not doing you any good at all. And here are the different stages of a relapse. Relapse is more more of a process than the singular event of resuming use. It's broken down into three stages, emotional, mental, and physical. Emotional relapse is often the first stage of relapse, and it occurs before someone in recovery even begins to consider using again. The individual usually starts to experience negative emotional responses, such as anger, moodiness, and anxious feelings. They also may begin to experience erratic eating and sleeping habits, and their desire for recovery often wanes due to a lack of using their support systems. These are the initial warning signs that a person in recovery could be entering the process of relapse, 
and it is important to recognize them as quickly as possible. This stage occurs before a person is even aware that they could be in danger of a relapse. And intervening now before they enter the mental relapse can prevent the issue from taking hold. Mental relapse is the second stage of the process. This is often a time of internal struggle for a person in recovery as part of them wants to remain on the road to long-term sobriety. However, that part of them is embattled in a tug of war of sorts with another side that wants to return to drinking. There may always be a part of a person that wants to use again, which is why alcoholism is considered to be a chronic condition. As this phase of the relapse process progresses, direct thoughts about drinking eventually arise and at this point, it's very difficult to stop the process. When someone dealing with alcoholism desi decides they're going back to drink, it's usually just a matter of time until they do it. Mental relapse is a very difficult state stage to come back from, and it often gives way to the third and final stage of the relapse process. Once mental relapse has occurred, it usually does not take very long to progress to the physical relapse stage. This is the stage that, that is most commonly thought of when one hears the term relapse. Physical relapse occurs when a person com consumes the substance, breaking their sobriety. Drinking just one time will eventually, eventually result in intense cravings to continue to drink. Now, are you obsessing about drinking or craving a drink? Sometimes newcomers and not so newcomers say that they are craving a drink. With alcoholism, once you've detoxed and gotten the alcohol out of your system, you don't crave a drink until you've had the first drink. You don't crave it until you have, you've had the first one. Prior to having the first drink, you have an obsession for a drink. And I'll explain this in uh, the next few paragraphs. And do you want to know why alcoholics drink? Well, I will tell you. Actually, uh, Dr. Silkworth tells us in the doctor's opinion uh, in the big book, uh, at the front of the big book, the doctor's opinion. Men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. The sensation is so elusive that while they admit it is injurious, they cannot after a time differentiate the true from the false. To them, their alcoholic life seems the only normal one. They are restless, irritable, and discontented unless they can again experience the sense of ease and comfort which comes at once by taking a few drinks, drinks which they see others taking with impunity. After they have succumbed to the desire again, as so many do, and the phenomenon of craving develops. They pass through the well-known stages of a spree, emerging remorseful with a firm resolution not to drink again. This is repeated over and over, and unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, there is very little hope of his recovery. I happen to be one of the alcoholics that is described in the doctor's opinion. I never drank because I liked the taste of alcohol. Every drink I ever took was for the effect. I have never had one drink. I still find it hard to have one of anything that I like. I've never had one donut, one chip. Uh, you know, that, that's who I am. Why do some of us relapse? Let's look at page 24 of the big book. The fact is that most alcoholics for, reason, for reasons yet obscure, have lost the power of choice and drink. Our so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. We are unable at certain times to bring into our consciousness with sufficient force the memory of the suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago. We are without defense against the first drink. The almost certain consequences that follow taking even a glass of beer not cried into the mind to deter us. If these thoughts occur, they are hazy 
and readily supplanted with the old threadbare idea that this time we shall handle ourselves like other people. There is a complete failure of the kind of defense that keeps one from putting his hand on a hot stove. Now, here's something to think about. Do you really want to drink or do you want to not feel? Do you want to drink or do you want to not feel? The great thing about AA is that we get our feelings back. The horrible thing about AA is that we get our feelings back. Sometimes newcomers say that they want to drink when what they really want to do is not feel. They may be going through a situation that they just don't want to deal with, so the old stinking thinking creeps in. Here's something else to ponder. Alcoholism doesn't really set in until we stop drinking. Prior to coming into AA and giving up the booze, we drank whenever we were stressed, worried, happy, sad, etc. Anytime alcoholism started to creep in, we would drink. We no longer have the option of drinking, so we have to deal with that crap without our usual crutch, alcohol. We now have to deal with situations. We have to deal with life sober. Many of us never develop the coping skills that many non-alcoholics seem to have. You can get a whole new crutch to help you cope with life on life's terms. That crutch can be AA in your higher power. I was and am a reader, so I read tons of books on developing coping skills my first five years or so in Alcoholics Anonymous, and you can do the same. Actually, nowadays, you can probably go on YouTube and look up uh, coping skills, you know, to develop your own set of coping skills. And here's a, an article on the Big Book's answer to relapse prevention. Our Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous promises us that when the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. Imagine three layers. The first layer is our bodily, bodily reaction to alcohol when we ingest it, the physical craving. Under that is the second layer, the insanity of the mind just before the first drink, the mental obsession. Under that is the third layer, the inward condition that triggers the second layer which in turn triggers the first, the spiritual malady. And here's some symptoms of this third layer as described in the big book. Being restless, irritable, and discontented. Having trouble with personal relationships. Not being able to control our emotional natures. Being a prey to or suffering from misery and depression. Not being able to make a living or a happy and successful life, having feelings of uselessness, being full of fear, unhappiness, inability to be of real help to other people, being like the actor who wants to run the whole show, being driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity. Self will run riot leading to a double life, living like a tornado running through the lives of others, exhibiting selfishness and inconsiderate habits. These name just a few of the symptoms of the spiritual malady that's, that's described throughout our text. But still in all, these are just symptoms of the spiritual malady. So what is the driving force of these symptoms? On page 62, the text explains that selfishness, self-centeredness, that we think is the root of our troubles. This selfishness, self-centeredness, or the ego, ego, as some people refer to it, drives us to respond to life situations with the above symptoms, as well as disorders and addictions other than alcoholism. If this selfishness, self-centeredness continues to manifest in an alcoholic's life, even in someone who is not drinking and continues to attend meetings, and the ego is not smashed 
and re-smashed by continuous applications of all 12 steps, the sober or just not drinking alcoholic is sure to drink again eventually, or even worse, continue to live miserably being undrunk, better known as the dry drunk. This is why we see people with 10 years or more in AA wind up in mental institutions and they haven't had a drink. They did not have a drop to drink. If you're suffering from symptoms of the spiritual malady, use these questions to try to get to the root of the problem. Has it been a while since you've taken another alcoholic through the steps? Exactly how long has it been? Has it been a while since you have gone through the steps yourself? How long? Have you ever taken all of AA's 12 steps? Have you done more than the fourth step, than one fourth step inventory? Have you omitted anything? Have you completed all your ninth step amends wherever possible? What remains to be done? Is there something wrong in your life that you will not face and make right? What is it? Is there a habit or indulgence you will not give up? What is that? Is there a person you will not forgive? Who is it? Is there a wrong, wrong relationship in your life you will not give up? What or who is it? Is there restitution you will not make? Is there something... Is there something God has already told you to do that you will not obey? And what is that? Are you working with the di disciplines and practices of steps 10 and 11, self-examination, meditation, and prayer consistently every day? On pages 14 and 15 of the big book, Bill writes, for, for if an alcoholic failed to perfect and enlarge his spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice for others, he could not survive the certain trials and low spots ahead. If he did not work, he would surely drink again. And if he drank, he would surely die. Then faith would be indeed dead. With us, it is just like that. And again, that's an online article and you can find that on bigbooksponsorship.org, an online article from bigbooksponsorship.org. Let's look at working with others. Our biggest tool in relapse prevention is working with others. Big Book, page 89. Practical experience shows that nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking as intensive work with other alcoholics. It works when other activities fail. This is our 12th suggestion. Carry this message to other alcoholics. You can help when no one else can. You can secure their confidence when others fail. Remember, they are very ill. Life will take on new, new meaning. To watch people recover, to see them help others, to watch loneliness vanish, to see a fellowship grow up about you, to have a host of friends. This is an experience you must not miss. We know you will not want to miss it. Frequent contact with newcomers and with each other is the bright spot of our lives. Did I say any more than that, what was stated in the previous paragraph? From 1935 until the spring of 39, there were only two AA meetings once a week in the world. One was in New York on Tuesday and the other one was in Akron. And I believe they were both on Tuesday nights. The early AA members did not stay sober because of meetings. They stayed sober by helping up, by helping and working with other, other drugs. Do yourself a favor and help someone else. The other person may benefit, but you will reap the greatest rewards. And here's something else to think about. Did you relapse or just fall off the wagon? Relapse is a verb. And the definition, one of the definitions is of someone suffering from a disease, suffered deterioration after a period of improvement. And here's an example. Two of the patients in, remit, in remission relapsed after 48 months. 
we, we use some terms rather loosely in Alcoholics Anonymous. We normally say that a person has one day of sobriety. A person is not sober after one day. When a person goes out and drinks, we automatically assume that they relapsed. Not many people relapse even if they didn't have a drink in many years because they were never in recovery. They never really improved. Uh, let us stipulate that alcoholism is a disease like cancer and diabetes. If a person has cancer and they never started treatment for that disease and die from it, we're not going to say that the cancer returned and they, pa and they then passed away. The cancer never went away, was never in remission if they didn't start treatment for that disease. If someone joins Alcoholics Anonymous but never takes the steps and they never changed, never had that spiritual awakening, we cannot say that they relapsed since the alcoholism was never in remission. They never got on the medication, so the alcoholism was always active in their system and not in remission. Therefore, they did not relapse. They just drank again. They were never sober, never in recovery. They were on the wagon. They were dry. And here's another one. Did you really slip? Slip is a verb. And one definition of a person or animal slide unintentionally for a short distance, typically losing one's balance or footing. I slipped on the ice. And that's another word we use rather loosely in Alcoholics Anonymous, is the word slip. Slip is a nice euphemism that is widely used in AA, but it is a, it's a myth. I don't think anyone actually slips in Alcoholics Anonymous, but I'll just say that in my opinion, most people do not slip when they go back out and drink. I just read one of the, one of the definitions of slip. I don't think anyone has ever slipped on a banana peel or ice and landed in a bar or at the liquor store. What we, myself included, often call a slip is a cold, calculated, premeditated drug. I'll even that add that some people don't drink on the day they slipped. Most slips happen days, weeks, or months prior to that person picking up that drink. I'm sure on some occasions a person slips years before they physically pick up that drink. Boredom and isolation could easily be listed as the number one reason for relapse by many individuals in early recovery. Any and all downtime prior to sobriety was usually used up drinking. Many people in AA say that they're only one drink away from a drunk. That's a fact I agree with. However, me personally, I am 12 plus steps away from that first drink. Long before I physically pick up a drink, I will have picked it up mentally. Many things will have to start changing and unraveling before I physically pick up that drink. What I do is keep myself in check, keep my character defects in check so that I can remain in fit spiritual condition and keep that obsession at bay. Are there some warning signs prior to a slip or a relapse? Now that you have already waved the white flag in sur of, of surrender to get sober, you may have started wondering what red flags you should look for in your recovery. No matter what happens in life, being prepared for what happens next is critical. This revelation is not intended to be negative in intent, but to inform you of what could happen if you let your guard down. The red flags of recovery need to be gauged because without knowledge of them, you may find yourself close to a relapse. One thing you may do is you stop going to meetings. Meetings are an essential part of recovery. Attending meetings keeps you accountable and allows you to seek the solution to alcoholism. You will also be able to fellowship with others to gain support and encouragement to keep coming back. The number one reason that people say they relapse is that they stopped going to meetings. You also get resentful easier. Once you start working a program of recovery, your resentments will lessen the more you look at them. 
when you find yourself getting restless, irritable, and discontent again, you should consider that you could get closer to, pick, closer to picking up a drink or a drug to cope. Resentment is the number one offender that could lead you straight to relapse before you realize what's happening. You also return to old behaviors. As much as you have worked hard to stop doing some of the behaviors associated with using alcohol, uh, once you find yourself backsliding, you may have a cause for concern. Practicing spiritual principles in all your affairs help you recognize when you are going back to your old ways. You also start isolating. Your alcoholism wants nothing more than for you to be alone. If you allow yourself to stop being around others, you could put yourself in a dangerous situation to let your addiction or alcoholism lead you back to drugs and alcohol. Recovery means surrounding yourself with people who will be there when you feel like being detached from everyone is a good idea. Recovery means surrounding yourself with people who will be there when you feel like being detached from everyone is a good idea. Before you think you have your recovery under control, just know that your alcoholism has a personal trainer, is doing MMA, taking steroids, and HDH waiting for you to make a wrong move. When I first came in in the 80s, uh, and even now people say, well, my disease is in the parking lot doing push-ups. But again, this was in the 80s, 90s. Nowadays, as I said, they're doing MMA, taking steroids, taking human growth hormones, and they have a personal trainer just waiting for, waiting for you to slip. Knowledge is potential power. So the more you understand what can make you, what can take you out of your sobriety, the better chance you will have to recognize it before it is too late. In many groups, the three month chip is a red colored chip because that can be a dangerous time for some people in, in sobriety. Keep waving the white flag so that the red flags do not have an opportunity to rise up. So we've done a podcast on emotional sobriety, what is it and how to maintain it. So be sure to check that out. It, it's, I think it's impossible to have long-term sobriety without having an emotional relapse uh, at some point probably many points in your sobriety, uh, you will have an emotional relapse. I, I know with 39 years of sobriety, I have had some, some emotional relapses, but I have not yet picked up a drink. And what you want to do is uh, try to prevent emotional relapse. And here are three ways to prevent emotional relapse. While sinking back in the negative emotions that once contributed to your alcoholism can be hard to manage, there are ways to avoid emotional relapse. Uh, one thing you can do is have self-care. One of the first things to take a hit from emotional relapse is self-care. It's important to stay on top of your physical, mental, and emotional wellness. Activities like exercise and getting enough sleep can go a long way. Use your support system. You worked hard to put a support system in place so be sure to use it. Sobriety is not something you have to go through alone. Don't be afraid to ask for help, no matter how long you've been sober. Well, I, I've noticed that uh, many groups online and uh, in person, they will uh, do everything for the newcomer, but then they tend to ignore the not so newcomer you know, thinking that, oh, they, they've been sober a while, they, they're good, they, they can handle it. But everyone needs help in Alcoholics Anonymous at some point. And another thing is actively acknowledge your feelings. Try not to suppress your thoughts or feelings. Work towards practicing higher self-awareness through activities like journaling or meditation. And definitely halt. Halt. Don't let yourself get too hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. Again, no matter how long you've been sober, you still can't allow yourself to get too hungry because you will then get become very angry 
and your tolerance gets very low. So no matter how long you've been sober, you don't want to get too hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, lonely or tired. That's when it's time to halt. And does everyone have to relapse? Does everyone eventually relapse? Relapse is not part of everyone's story. You do not have to relapse if you have not yet relapsed. If you've already relapsed, you don't have to relapse again. So what do you do if you have relapsed? If you've relapsed, don't throw in the towel on your sobriety. Relapse is a signal that you still have work to do. You can learn from this and move forward in sobriety, stronger and with a better handle on what you need for long-term recovery. Depending on the severity of your relapse, Perhaps you can get back on track with meetings and 12-step work with a sponsor. Sometimes one needs to go to detox and or a treatment, uh, a treatment center. Sometimes being sober in a sober house, in a sober house helps a person. Even if you're married and have a house of your own, spending a few months in a sober house is beneficial. I've known people to do that. Uh, each person is different, however, but many people have gotten sober and stayed sober through Alcoholics Anonymous. Outside therapy along with AA is something to consider if there are issues still unresolved in your life. There's nothing wrong with getting outside help. If you're the loved one of an individual who's relapsed, it's important not to blame or shame them. This will only put them on the defense and make them feel worse which could encourage a further spiral into alcoholism. The individual who's relapsed is likely already putting an immense amount of shame and blame on themselves. The best way to avoid relapsing is to take the steps, have the psychic change, work with others, and never ever rest on your laurels. And this is from the big book, page 85. It is easy to let up on the spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels. We are headed for trouble if we do, for alcohol is a subtle foe. We are not cured of alcoholism. What we really have is a da daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. Every day is a day when we must carry the vision of God's will into all of our activities. How can I best serve thee, thy will, not mine be done. These are thoughts which must go with, with us constantly. We can exercise our willpower along this line all we wish because it is the proper use of the will. And again, that was from the big book, page 85. If you have relapsed, thank your higher power that you made it back into the rooms of AA because not everyone makes it back. The Lord does not always swing both ways. And if you have not yet relapsed, you don't have to relapse in the future. Believe me, it's easier to stay sober than it is to get sober. And Alcoholics Anonymous is the easier, softer way, no matter what. And please remember, remember, you don't fail till you've stopped trying. You do not fail until you have stopped trying. And as always, we suggest that you get out of your comfort zone. Get out of your comfort zone until it becomes comfortable. And don't be afraid of faking it until you make it. Again, initially, it'll be very uncomfortable, but do it anyway. And this ends our podcast, but before parting, I'd like you to get to know hope so that you can get to know recovery. Because if you have no hope, there might be no recovery. Be a hope dealer. Let's take a moment to reflect on what we did here today, followed by the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Once again, thank you for listening to the Zuku Recovery Life podcast on relapse prevention. My name is John A. and I am an alcoholic in West Palm Beach, Florida. My sobriety date is September 13th, 1982. You can visit our website at thezookrew.org, thezookrew.org, 
feel free to like this video and subscribe to our channel and hit the notification button so you can be notified when we upload new videos. Leave a comment and we will respond. If you like our message, please share our podcast site with others. Thank you. Have a great day. And remember, you never have to have a bad day, just bad moments. Thank you.